this week. Campaigning is in full swing as elections draw near in two African countries. Gabonese President Ali Bongo is seeking a third term in office. We'll look at Gabon's future and the 55-year Bongo dynasty in the oil-rich West African nation. Also, in Zimbabwe, President Emerson Nangagwa is facing 10 candidates at the polls next week. With three quarters of the population under the age of 34, will Zimbabwe's youth decide this election? In the next half hour, we'll bring you reporting and analysis. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome to Straight Talk Africa, coming to you from VOA's headquarters in Washington. I'm Heidi Adams. This week we focus on two countries that will vote in general elections next week, Zimbabwe and Gabon. And we begin with Gabon in West Africa. And joining me here in studio is my colleague Idrissa Fall. But let's first... Um, give us a little bit more information about what is happening in um, Gabon at the moment. Here, the Bongo family has ruled the oil-rich nation of Gabon for over five decades. President Ali Bongo, who took over from his father, Omar Bongo Ondimba, in 2009, has been in power for nearly 14 years. He's already served two terms in office. Bongo survived a stroke and a coup attempt in 2019, but says he is, quote, more ready than ever for a third term. 18 other candidates candidates will be on the ballot in the August 26th general election. And as I said earlier, I'm joined here in studio by my colleague Idrissa Fall. He is a broadcast journalist in VOA's French to Africa news service. And this time we cross to you for real. Idrissa, thank you so much for joining me here. I'm, I'm really keen to find out more about what is going on in Gabon, a country that English, um, the English parts of Africa don't often um, have as part of general conversation. So tell us a little bit about President Ali Bongo, who leads the Gabonese Democratic Party. He says he's more than ready now for a third term, and there are, of course, 18 other candidates on the ballot. But Bongo comes into this election not just with practically all the money in the world, but also vast patronage networks and all the state machinery behind him. Um, what chance, then, does an opposition stand, and a very divided opposition, what chance do they stand in this election? Well, because the opposition is divided, it looks like they open a huge boulevard for Mr. Ali Bongo, because they don't agree among themselves. They're 18, uh, and uh, most people who know is Chambrier, who is one of the leading candidates of the opposition, and uh, that lady from uh, National Union. And uh, they cannot agree on one single candidate for the opposition, which may help Mr. Bongo get re-elected. You know, the, even in his own party, some people don't follow him. So it, nobody can predict what will happen right. on uh, August 26th in Gabon. Um, tell us a little bit what is Bongo's record. Of course, he is the face of the Bongo family, the political dynasty in the country. And Gabon is one of the wealthiest countries in Africa. It has a population of just over 2.3 million. Um, but most people still live in poverty in that country. So what is the platform that President Bongo can campaign on? The platform, on? you know, when he arrived in power in 2009, uh, people were telling that you are the son of your dad. And, uh, right. But he managed to get rid of that, that vision of him and uh, present himself as uh, somebody who's going to bring changes. Right. And uh, a lot of people believe in him, and, uh, but those changes did not follow. And uh, for after his two mandates, uh, people are still very poor. Besides the facades of big cities in Libreville, when you go behind those official buildings, people uh, live in uh, real, real, real poverty, you know, uh, right. into slums, they don't have water, electricity does not go there, they don't have roads. So it's a very rich country, but uh, you don't, they did not invest the money for the development of the people of Gabon. Right. So people hope he will do something. It was at the election of 2016 against Jinping, was very tough because he barely won with 5,000 
like votes. Like 5,500 votes Yeah, something the last like time, that. Right. And uh, it sparked violence. It was very, very violent. I was there in 2016. And then since Mr. Jinping, who was claiming he won, he's there and decided that he's not going to support uh, nobody. And uh, the country is there. And now Mr. Bongo presents himself as the, the champion of environment. Because, right, uh, so not change now, it's environment yeah, this time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's environment. And uh, people are giving him money, and uh, he has a huge party, uh, the Gabonese Democratic Party, PDG. He has the support in France, because uh, France was the country holding his right. dad and himself uh, to power, right. and uh, because they have the oil access to right all the economy and uh, the guy is playing very well here in the US people love him because he speaks English. And I saw that firsthand it, yeah. when he was here in Washington for sure. Yeah, pe people it's, always, love him, yeah. it's always perplexing um, Idrissa when you look at a country that's what the third wealthiest country in Africa it only has a population of 2.3 million that it has to take care of and with that well, much wealth. It may not be that difficult but it was not done. Right. And uh, At the end of the day. now it, this was the chance for the opposition, but the u opposition does not unify and right. it will help him. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm quite sure and maybe, but I, it's even the prime minister, actual Alain Bilibinze, launched a warning telling guys, let's be careful and not bring violence into this election. But when it happened in 2006, nobody was thinking it would happen. You know. And in 2019, Bongo had a serious health scare. He, he had a stroke. He survived also a coup um, attempt. Now, given the fact that we're seeing a resurgence of coups in the region, um, but also at the same time, this is a country that is surrounded by countries like Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon, where political dynasties are still very much the order of the day. Um, should someone and, and like don't, Bongo... And don't forget Congo Brazzaville. Congo Brazzaville. <laughs> so. um, should someone like Bongo be worried about another coup attempt. That, that coup attempt, you know, seven officers and uh, even people doubt it was a real one because right. uh, you don't do a coup like that. They are in jail and, uh, uh, and coups in Gabon did happen in before the past, correct. and the French come and uh, uh, I and think help uh, his dad to stay in power until now. But in Gabon coup, I doubt. And so he has nothing to worry about uh, on that? No, not that. Even with uh, no. potential health problems again in future? He, he, surprised, he surprised everybody because after his stroke, he had a mobility issue with his arm, his leg, and a came and tell guys, I'm going to run for a third mandate. And uh, nobody expected him to do that well, or to say that. But uh, he's just here running again, and uh, we'll find out after the, the 26th. The kind of bravery only politicians have. <laughs> Idrissa Fell, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming in and helping put all of this in context for us. I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Idrissa Fell is a journalist within VOA's French to Africa news service. We give him all our thanks for coming in here. Well, still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa, Zimbabweans go to the polls next week. Inflation is spiking as President Emerson Mnangagwa seeks a second term. How much has Zimbabwe changed on his watch? My guests are standing by. Straight Talk Africa will be back in a moment. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. You're watching VOS Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us each week right here on Red Carpet. We'll bring you the latest in.
wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Linoch Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. You're with Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back. Zimbabweans will, will vote on Wednesday, August 23rd, to decide who will lead the Southern African nation for the next five years. Eleven candidates are running for president. Now, the contest will primarily be between these two men, the incumbent 80-year-old President Emerson Mnangagwa, who is vying for a second term. He came to power in 2017 in a coup that deposed Zimbabwe's former longtime ruler, Robert Mugabe. Mnangagwa Mnangagwa walked away from the general election in 2018 with 50.8% of the vote. His ruling ZANU-PF has been in power for 43 years. Now, Mnangagwa's main rival is this man, Nelson Chamisa. He leads the opposition Citizens Coalition for Change, or Triple C. At 45 years old, he is Zimbabwe's youngest ever presidential candidate. This is Chamisa's second bid for power and his first as leader of the Triple C, which launched last year. Chamisa is promising to tackle corruption and the country's economic problems. Now, political parties in Zimbabwe are bracing for the country's general election, and that will pit President Emerson Mangagwa against Nelson um, Chamisa and uh, nine other candidates. Here is our reporter, Columbus Mavunga, with a story from Harare. It is about a week away from Zimbabwe's August 23 general elections. <laughs> Election campaigns are in full swing, aimed at youth who make up more than three quarters of Zimbabwe's population. Voters like 24-year-old Bridget Mabanda. We want things to change as youth. As you can see, we are suffering from Zimbabwe. We are suffering. Everything is upside down. We are in potholes. Our money is not stable. And even our education, you can see from the fees that we are, we are, we are paying, uh, it's not affordable to us as compared to what our parents are earning. We want a better Zimbabwe. We want our future to be bright because of this person. I think when I'm going to vote, I'm going to vote wisely concerning this. I want a better Zimbabwe. Bridget's generation has only ever known as Zimbabwe mad in economic crisis, sky high inflation, and chronic unemployment. UNICEF estimates the unemployment rate among Zimbabwe's youth is at 35%. Although official unemployment figures inside Zimbabwe are hard to come by. Some young people turn to Zimbabwe's growing informal economy for work. The person I'm voting for, firstly, he must stop corruption. Then the hospitals should have medicines and get enough salaries. Police should do their job properly and the thieves get caught. In addition, the children should be well taken care of so they don't do drugs and they get employed easily, take care of their parents, and jobs should be created. Zimbabwe is one of the highest inflation rates in the world, topping 175% last month according to government statistics. President Munanga Gwa has promised to revive the economy should he win a second term. His 10 election competitors for the presidency are trying to capitalize on what they see as a Zimbabwe spectacular economic meltdown during ZANPF's 43-year rule. Munanga was main rival, 45-year-old Nelson Chamisam from the Citizens Coalition for Change, or Triple C, appears to have tapped into the youth's frustrations. He has promised an end to corruption and economic decline. But some, like 35-year-old Justin Guanzu, who fondly refer to the president by his initials ED, believes Mnangagwa deserves a second term. ED fame data. ED fame data. That's what we want. Industries to be revived and we start going to work so that we live a decent life. We want him to continue as president so that we work in companies and get pay slips. 35 years and I do not know what a pay slip is. I've never received one. He renovated the roads. We saw that. But we need companies. That's all we ask for. 
Alexander Rusero, a politics professor at Africa University in Zimbabwe, says so far the run-up to next week's election has been peaceful compared to previous cycles. Yes, we have witnessed skirmishes here and there uh, by some enthusiastic uh, ZANPF party supporters against the C. but this is not a coordinated and systematic approach as was the case in the past, coordinated at the highest level uh, of the party. They are there to prove that they have departed from the estual script where the electoral period was actually a war zone. As Zimbabweans count down to the second post Mugabe era election, voters on both sides of the political divide hope they will finally see stability and a return to prosperity in what was once one of Africa's wealthiest countries. From Harare in Zimbabwe, Columbus Mafunga for VOA Africa. And that was Columbus Mavunga reporting there from Harare. Well, if no presidential candidate wins a clear majority in the first round of elections next week, a runoff will be held on October 2nd. My guests today are Blessing Zulu. He is a, a journalist with VOA's Zimbabwe News Service. He's here in studio with me. And joining us from Cape Town, South Africa, is Chipo Dendere. She's an assistant professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College um, here in the United States. Thank you and a warm welcome, Blessing and a Professor Dendera, so great to have you. Um, a blessing, I want to start with you. You know, elections are often described in terms of being a litmus test or a turning point, putting a country at a crossroads. We've all seen those kinds of descriptions. Um, how would you describe this election coming up next week in Zimbabwe? I think uh, it can at best be described as uh, what uh, Professor uh, Terry Carr of Stanford University called uh, electoralism. Uh, it's a guided uh, democracy. Uh, you cannot say it's really uh, a, a, a democratic um, election uh, with uh, what we are seeing in Zimbabwe. The opposition today is actually in court uh, because they don't have the final uh, voters' role. Uh, there are also uh, complaints about uh, the yesterday 40 opposition supporters were arrested. So in as much as um, there is no bloodshed like what was uh, witnessed in previous elections, the uh, ruling ZANU-PF party is calling what analysts are saying is lawfare. They are using uh, the courts to thwart the opposition from uh, campaigning. They are also using the, pol uh, the police to uh, stop the opposition from campaigning. So I would not uh, say that uh, it is really um, a democratic process that is going on. And uh, you also have uh, groups such as the Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch. Uh, the United States uh, government is also, uh, these uh, groups have uh, decided not to do what we call um, Monday morning quarterbacking. They've already said this election is not going to be free and fair because of uh, five years of uh, a systematic crackdown on the opposition. I'm going to pretend I understand what Monday morning quarterbacking um, means <laughs> since I don't watch American football. Um, but, Professor, some of the themes that my colleague Blessing has just spoken about here, I remember as a reporter in South Africa, a lot of my coverage um, was during the then President Robert Mugabe and his rival Morgan Changarai during that era. In comparison to that, if you look at the political landscape in Zimbabwe today and the dynamics between our President Emerson Mnangagwa and his main rival Nelson Chamisa, what would you say are the similarities and what are the differences? that you see in the two eras? I think the first thing to note is that the shift from Robert Mugabe to uh, Emerson Nagawa did not bring the change that people expected. And so in that sense, it's very disappointing. There was a sense of Zimbabwe is going to be more open, people will be able to speak freely. But what we've seen under the Nagawa regime are these bills that have curtailed citizen participation. So there is the bill that's aimed at curtailing the voices of civil society that's uh, at the president's desk right now. Um, it, that bill actually came before Robert Mugabe once, and he sent it back to parliament. We don't know what Emerson Nagawa is going to do with that bill. But that's just something that was unexpected uh, by people when they marched in 2017 for the ouster of Robert Mugabe. So that comes with very disappointing. The other thing is, you know, like Blessing mentioned, lawfare using courts to adjudicate the election. 
saying that certain candidates should not be participating. The opposition has spent a lot of money, a lot of time fighting for their candidates to be on the ballot. That's, again, something that we hadn't seen before. So it's these new kinds of restrictions to democracy that are very concerning. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, I think I'll get in trouble with most Zimbabweans by saying this, but I also think that the Nagabo regime is quite sensitive, perhaps, to their global perception. So a couple of things that are different. I've seen that they've had two commercials of the opposition on um, the national television. That's new. Uh, now, the coverage is not fair. The coverage is slanted. But the fact that they did put these two commercials of the opposition and they have covered the opposition rallies on national television, that's important. At the same time, they've also been trying to ban opposition rallies. So the opposition has only now been able to have um, very big rallies across the country because most of their rallies, especially in rural areas, were being banned or they were being told that you cannot meet. Uh, meanwhile, ZANPF has been having rallies undisturbed. Um, a blessing, a large theme from this election is the power of the youth vote. Um, as we heard, two-thirds of the country now under the age of 34. Um, yes, there is power in the youth vote, but how energized is this voting bloc? I think uh, that is the uh, problem. Um, if the opposition can manage to turn out the youth vote uh, in urban areas, they stand a chance. Uh, but, of course, um, 61 uh, 0.8% of the population is in the rural areas, uh, where, which uh, traditionally is Zanupia for a stronghold. So it's going to be an uphill uh, task uh, for the uh, opposition to motivate uh, the youth to go to the polls. If they can manage to do that, they stand a chance. But uh, it's very difficult. And again, uh, in the run-up to the elections, uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which is supposed to register voters, uh, there are accusations that uh, it did not um, like go to uh, most centers in the urban areas, for example, to register the youths. So, of course, most of them are not registered. Uh, the people who are going to vote are slightly over 6 million, uh, but of course, uh, mostly in the rural areas. That brings me nicely to my next point, Professor. Um, you know, uh, I, I remember when I, in African politics class at university, um, we, we studied why Africa has this problem with weak opposition in so many African countries. Um, and, you know, of course, um, one, some several of the factors were that, A, they organized too late. Um, they're their strongholds are mostly in urban areas and of course the liberation movements as we have still in southern africa um, liberation movements have they've got the support base that they have built over generations um, with their strongholds being in the rural areas are you still seeing some of these factors coming into play in this election cycle in zimbabwe absolutely the, as blessing has already said the, the base for the opposition is in urban areas Research that a colleague and I just concluded showed us that the average person would have had to travel 10 kilometers in order to register to vote. Now, that's just not something that a lot of young people are going to invest time and money in doing. And because we don't yet have the electronic voters' roll, it's been very difficult to ascertain how many young people are registered to vote. The second challenge, uh, well, that perhaps you didn't cover in your classes, is that money matters. Mm -hmm. uh, ruling parties have a lot of money. Earlier you were speaking to a colleague on Gabon. Uh, the ruling party in Gabon is able to use, you know, state resources from natural resources. And the party in Zimbabwe does the same thing. They have access to the national coffers. You can't run elections on zero dollars. And that's the biggest challenge for opposition parties all across Africa, particularly in the Zimbabwean case. The C simply does not have the resources that they need to run an effective election. This is even made more complicated because ZANU-PF instituted laws that say that political parties cannot get money from um, outside the country, right? So it means that the C, even though their base is in the diaspora, they cannot legally ask for donations from the diaspora. So that puts them in a serious bind. Uh, and then the other thing is, how do you get the rural voters? Now, the good news is that Chemisai has been um, very forward in going to the rural areas. We've had conversations with him. We've seen him campaigning very strongly in rural areas. 
the question isn't whether he, the message has arrived to rural voters. It's whether or not rural voters will feel comfortable on election day to put their X on Nelson Chimisa. Because in the past, we know that rural voters have been told, listen, if you put your X on anybody but ZANU PF, we can trace your vote. Now, rural voters need to be convinced and, and I don't want to say educated because we don't want to give the impression that they're not educated, but they need to be convinced that their vote is going to be protected and that they are going to be protected should they vote their will. And that's the biggest challenge, right? Because rural voters, unlike urban voters, have some experience with violence um, out of the liberation struggle over the last uh, 40 years in Zimbabwe. They understand violence in a way that urban voters might not. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, wanting to preserve themselves, they might vote um, for the ruling party. So that's the biggest challenge for the opposition. Can they convince rural voters that their vote is protected and that they too will be protected if they vote their choice. Excellent points there, Professor. And you are right. We didn't talk money in my class. Um, a blessing, um, the triple C. We spoke earlier, the professor spoke about money, but was timing also a factor? I mean, the fact that um, Nelson Chamisa launched triple C just early last year, um, is that something that could, um, you know, negatively affect him? I mean, that's not really a long time to, to organize and build the kind of infrastructure that readies you for an election? I think his advantage was that uh, uh, most people in Zimbabwe knew what was happening uh, because after the uh, 2017 uh, election, 2018 election rather, um, in which he garnered about 44% uh, of the uh, vote, um, there was, uh, you know, uh, problems in the uh, MDC, the opposition party that he was ruling, that um, some analysts claim uh, was actually engineered by the ruling ZANU-PF party. Of course, uh, ZANU-PF denies this. Uh, and then uh, Chamisa uh, lost in the courts, uh, mm -hmm. not surprising. Uh, yeah. And then this forced him to uh, form the, uh, the triple C. Uh, but he is popular with the people. That's his advantage. Uh, but of course, uh, he lost now the money that is given to uh, parties that get 5%, at least 5% of the votes from the state to fund your campaigns. So because he was ousted from the um, MDC, he lost that. So uh, it is an uphill task for him uh, in this particular election. Well, next week, as when the rubber meets the road, we will be keeping an eye, of course, on the election. Um, uh, Professor Chipo Dendera and Blessing Zulu, thank you so much. I wish we had a little bit more time, but I do thank you for your insights and for your time. Thank you. And that is where we will leave our show today. A big thanks to all my guests, of course, and our affiliate stations carrying Straight Talk Africa throughout the African continent. Do be sure to follow us on social media. You can also get more news from across the African continent on voaafrica.com. Thanks so much for being with me this week. Until next time, goodbye.